What's going on, people? We are Tottenham TV back here for some more content. We are back, and I just want to say a massive thank you to the two Brian's, Brian Island and Brian Daigle, Tottenham on tour for taking over the channel while we were away. We are back now. A very heavy weekend, a very good weekend as well. Um, so yeah, it was a good weekend, wasn't it? Still recovering. Yeah, <laughs> just, just about, just about got here. But we're right. We're here, ready to go. Talk about Spurs again. Love it. Come exactly. on. Exactly, and um, a few bits and pieces to get onto and let's start off with the athletic article on Harry Kane um, which says that um, you know Manchester United are going to try or will want to sign Harry Kane this summer and George Mendes has taken it upon himself to look for replacements uh, and Darwin Nunes and Tammy Abraham uh, for Tottenham Hotspur um, I actually haven't seen the article you've got it there in front of you I mean what what do you take away from it and there's there's just pure speculation. Um, a lot of it. Obviously, look, Man United one came this summer. No surprise there. Um, t uh, Ma you know, Man. They're saying Man City unlikely to probably go back in for Harry Kane. Um, they're saying the price for Harry Kane is going to be over 100 million. No surprise there. Um, they're saying George Mendes is sounding out replacements for Kane, but not under instruction from Tottenham, but going off his own back. He's looking to profit from the situation. No surprise there. Mm. Nothing really to learn, I don't think, from yeah. this article, really. Um, not, not to say it's, not, it's um, not a good article, it's just the, the information is not uh, groundbreaking, really. But I don't think he's... I, again, they're saying Kane's future is tied to Conte and tied to where we finished the league. No surprise there. Nothing really uh, surprising about this. So, yeah, just ba basically just general speculation on Harry Kane. I mean, the media love trying to push Harry Kane out of Tottenham. That's, mm -hmm. that's uh, I guess, the only takeaway that you can take away from this. It happens every few months. Um, an article will come out from a different publication trying to push Harry Kane out of Tottenham. Uh, but we all know full well that um, if the club don't go in the right direction this summer, if we don't get what we want and what Conte wants, and if Conte does ultimately uh, want to leave, then uh, Kane will be following him out the door, won't he? And that's the only really thing that we well, can yeah, say. Well, yeah, because uh, if he, because he probably won't. He, I, again, he'll have to sign a contract if he wants to stay, um, and he won't be signing that contract unless he feels the club's going the right way. So, and when it comes to replacing him, it's definitely can't be Tammy <coughs> Abraham or Nunes to replace him. It has to be both of them. It can't be one. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there has been some uh, quotes from Dejan Kulisevsky on Harry Kane as well. And he says um, he is a very humble person, doesn't command a lot of attention. But on the pitch, he has really surprised me among the best players I have ever played with. Incredible touch, incredible passes, incredible finishes. Amazing, uh, amazingly fun for me to get to play with. Um, so he's putting, up, he's putting him up there with the likes of uh, Cristiano Ronaldo. Because uh, obviously Kulisevsky played with Ronaldo at Juventus, uh, but he's saying Harry Kane, one of the best players he's ever played with, and um, not not. He's only twenty one. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I d he said uh, he, Kane surprised him. So maybe when it comes to even ha knowing how good Kane is, sometimes you don't you don't realize how good a player is until you're seeing him in the flesh, until you're spending like day to day with them, like Kulisevsky is, and uh, it shows even though. I'm sure Kulusevski was expecting Kane to be a world-class player. Even, even he's surprised by how good Kane actually is. It shows the level he's at. Yeah, and I can kind of um, relate to that a little bit. Obviously, I haven't played with anyone world-class, mm -hmm. but um, you know, when you're watching kind of Lionel Messi, uh, stuff like that, when you're watching him week in, week out, and all the highlights coming out, you're like, wow, what an unbelievable player. But it was only until I actually saw him live in the Fletcher, that game at Wembley, you're just like jaw-dropping. It's just absolutely jaw-dropping seeing that actually in front of you. And mm. that, that moment when I saw Messi, I was like, wow, this guy, man, this guy is just too good. Just way too good. That performance he put on that day. And, and it's not something that you don't know because you see it week in, week out, don't you, on the highlights reels and everything like that. But I think it's actually when you see it in front of you, you get a different perspective on it. Mm, definitely. Um, all right, let's move on. There's some more quotes here. The next one is from Hugo Lloris, uh, which is quite interesting, these quotes. And he says, since the arrival of Antonio Conte, we sense a real progression. Even if we've had a few difficulties, uh, we get the feeling that we're taking it to the next level as a team. And I think that we'll be ready for the final push to go and get that European spot. Um, and that's the kind of sense I get as well watching Spurs over the last few weeks. It seems as though we have kind of 
got over a few hardships this season under Antonio and it looks as though we are kind of on a good track at the moment, on the right path. Yeah, we well, seem to be going in the right direction. I think we're finding our consistency, not not necessarily with um, results. As I mean, we are doing results as well. Four four wins out of five in the league, although there is um, a cup a cup exit to Middlesbrough in the in the middle of that. Uh, I think with performances, I think we are definitely starting to do. It. I think you know performances against Man United. I think that was that was that was pretty good as well. Even though we lost that game, I think um, ever since the uh, Wolves game. Um, I think we've um, put in putting in fairly consistent, consistently high performances, um, and we're scoring goals. That's definitely a massive positive. We, we, you know, we've won four of the last five by two or more goals as well. So I think there's a reason to be optimistic going to the second half of the season. Not second half, sorry, last bit of the season, last ten games. That um, that we can definitely make a really good push for that top four if we can keep up this level. I think um, right now. In a weird way, I actually think we're playing better than Arsenal right now, even though mm. Arsenal are winning more games. I think our performances, I think we're more convincing when we win than they are. Yeah, um, I take that point. And also, uh, when you look at it, when Conte first came and we went on that stretch of, like, was it eight or nine games unbeaten? Yeah. Uh, as opposed to when you look at it now, where it's not eight or nine games unbeaten, but I actually feel that the performances now and the structure of the team now is looking a lot better than it did in those kind of eight or nine game stretch. Well, with time, isn't it? It's always going to get better, isn't it? And I think um, the fullbacks definitely getting more involved than they were before. Doxy's obviously finding a new level, and Kul- adding Kuluseski and Bentancor has really, That's really been massive, helped. Yeah. Massive. So it's good. And, and obviously, um, Harry Kane as well, who's stepped up massively uh, since then. I mean, he's like. Since that kind of period in the last like six or seven games, you'll be hard to say that he's not the best player, performing player in the Premier League right now. Mm-hmm. Of course, yeah, no one's. I don't think anyone's playing as good as him right now. Uh, next up, we've got some injury news. Let's start off with Oli Skip. As Dan Kilpatrick says, Antonio Conte's chances of Halle having Oli Skip back for Newcastle as hoped are extremely unlikely. Obviously, Conte did come out uh, in the press conference uh, just before the last game saying he does hope Oli Skip or he thinks Oli Skip will be back after the international break. Uh, but that doesn't seem the case anymore, which is uh, very annoying, mm. isn't it? I guess a way to hear from Conte um, at the end of the week to get a better perspective. But um, if that's true, that he's uh, definitely not going to be fit, then that's um, another another big blow in, in terms of having him available for the last bit of stretch of the season. Because, uh, you know, you, we thought maybe if he, if he spends the international break getting fit, he'll be all, and he, if he's back for this Newcastle game, then we'll have him available. But... He's been such a big player for us ever since Conte's coming in for the majority of the season. He brings a lot of stability to the team, even though I think we are finding it now, Benzikor and Hoybier. If one of them gets injured, um, then we're in trouble without uh, Skippy available. So it's very annoying. It's dragging on even more. Conte is getting more and more frustrated every time he talks about it. But what can we do? He's uh, got to make sure that he's free of pain before he um, comes back into the uh, fold again. Otherwise, you're risking just aggravating it and being out for longer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And some more injury news, this time on Ben Davis. Um, He was, um, you know, he's back at Hotspur Way now. He left uh, the Wales training camp with some injury fears. Um, Ali Gold says Tottenham defender Ben Davis has returned to Spurs as a precaution after feeling tightness in one of his quad muscles in his thigh. Uh, But Charlie Eccleshare of The Athletic um, has said that there's good news for Tottenham Hotspur that Ben Davis' injury is not thought to be as... Uh, to be serious he's expected to be fit for Sunday's game against Newcastle and it's great news I mean you would have said Ben Davis last year if he would have got an injury no one would have uh, worried too much but since Conte's come here he's only missed two games um, and he's performing at a really good level and when you're looking at Ben Davis if he was going to get injured who do you put in at that left back in that left uh, centre back slot so massive news there yeah yeah, um, so I'm very happy that it's only that it's only precautionary because I think it's not just his defensive ability, but I think building the play out from the back, I think Davis is actually quite important in that role in his ability to pass the ball into central areas and with pace and accuracy. Um, and I think he does that quite well. So I think I don't think we have another centre back available who could do that role as well as him in the squad in that in on the left side anyway. So um, I was a bit worried when I heard he you know he's been out the squad and maybe he'll be missing a few games. But thankfully he's going to be fine and we're uh, we're going to need him. We're definitely going to need him from now to the end of the season to step up. Absolutely. Um, moving on. 
Jermaine Defoe we're going to talk about now. Uh, obviously, he announced his retirement last week at the age of, I think, 39 he is now, mm. uh, Jermaine Defoe. Sammy Mockbell uh, says that Tottenham have opened the door to Jermaine Defoe to return the club to compete to complete his coaching badges, uh, which would be absolutely brilliant to see uh, Jermaine Defoe around the training ground with the pictures and everything that comes out from training. And I think that, um, I actually think he'd be a good coach, Jermaine. I really do. Maybe a good striker coach. That'd be, yeah, I mean, I don't know about his overall. I mean, he was always offside. I mean, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm guessing if he, if he was uh, coaching a team, he'll never um, be an offside trap. But um, sure, I think Defoe coming as a striker coach, he knows how to be explosive. He was uh, over longevity as well. He did over a, a very long period, um, fairly consistently scoring goals throughout it, apart, you know, apart from a few um, off, off seasons he had. Um, and I'd, I'd, obviously, he's, he's, he's a massive fan favourite at Tottenham. Um, he's known around the club as well. Kane obviously um, knew him when he was breaking into the team, so I'm sure he'll be, it'll be a massive. Um, I think it would be a, a good thing if he, if he was being part of the club again and be coach. Absolutely. Um, next up, let's talk about some transfers now. As the sport are reporting on Adama Traore yet again. Here we uh, go again. <laughs> exactly, and uh, they say although uh, they want to the player to stay. Barcelona do not want to activate Adama Traore's 30 million uh, purchase clause. Uh, many Premier League clubs, including Tottenham, are keeping track of his future. Are you still interested in bringing him through? Mm, yeah, if, 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 it's a, if, it's, if it's a possibility. I, I, I think um, it's one of those ones where he wouldn't be my first choice, although I do think he's playing very, very well at Barcelona right now. He's had a good start to his um, time there. Um, showing maybe that with better players he can be a lot more productive and actually be um, not as frustrating as he is when he's playing when he played for like Middlesbrough and Wolves and but yeah I definitely I'd be interested in him but it's whether he wants to play right wing back or not because I don't know if I'd want him to replace Kudelski on the right uh, maybe I'd want him on the right hand side playing with Doherty though for sure mm -hmm. but whether he's fit for that role can suit that role for himself whether he's up for it um, I don't know. It's a big question mark. Yeah, I mean, for me, I'd, I'd prefer to sign a natural uh, right wing back first and foremost if we're going to sign a player in that position. I mean, I'd like Adama Traore maybe to be in and around the squad, but... Um, I think I'd still want him. I think he could be a very valuable asset. Yeah, I mean, he's got attributes that no one else can offer. Uh, no one that we can sign can offer, but... I think I'd still prefer to sign a natural right wing back. Um, but I'm not saying that I wouldn't like to sign a Dharma at all. Um, I would like to sign him, but only if um, maybe some other key targets aren't available, um, in my opinion. Mm. Um, next up, let's talk about Delhi Ali. As Team Talk are saying that Everton are looking to sell Delhi in the summer before being required to pay Tottenham any costly future payments. And I was actually hmm. um, talking about this with someone, I can't remember who it was, and I was saying that if Everton get injured, Relegated, you mean? I mean, if ever, uh, yeah, if Everton get relegated, then first of all, Delhi will probably want to leave in the summer, and Everton will probably want to get rid because they don't want to sell this forty million. Uh, they don't want to spend this forty million. So, this deal could end up being a complete disaster for us in terms of literally hmm. just a free transfer. Yeah, it could well be because he has to play at least twenty games just to activate the ten million, and that, cause that even that is a possibility of not happening right now. So could end up making a loss on him after spending five million and going for free hopefully they stay up i do think they will stay up um, but look the fixtures they have it's touch and go right now but um hopefully they do step but at the moment he's not even getting started starts is he so hardly getting cats bench cameos really. so they could in theory even if they do stay up they could still sell him if they don't think it's worth their time keeping him if he yeah. doesn't i think he really has to make an impact from now to the end of the season with a few goals or to do something to convince everton that um, he is worth playing more and, and even stumping up the 40 million more because right now they could think even if they do stay up if he does nothing they'll be like why are we keeping this guy around if we play him he's gonna we're gonna have to pay 40 million potentially and at the moment he's if we, he's not doing anything when he plays so what's the point of playing him yeah um and that's the that's the kind of uh weird situation they've got themselves in has he played more than like 10 minutes at a stretch of a time for everton yet I don't know if he started any game. That's what I'm saying. I don't, I don't think he started any Maybe game. Maybe, no, he, he came on at half-time one game or early on in the first yeah. half, didn't he? Yeah, but I'm, I'm trying to think. Maybe in the cup did he start potentially? I can't remember, but he hasn't started many games, mm. if any. 
for Sad State of Affairs for Delhi Alley. Uh, next up, uh, Tyreek Mitchell of Crystal Palace. Tom Barkley from The Sun is saying that Tottenham, amongst a host of other clubs, including Man City, Chelsea and Newcastle, are keeping track of youngster Tyreek Mitchell's progress. Um, would you want him through the door? Again, I like him. Um, I think he's developing really, really well at um, Palace. Obviously getting an England squad now, um, showing how much people think of him. However, in it depends. If we if Conte left and we got someone like Poch back in, yeah, I'd have him, 100%. I think he'd be a very good option at left, left back. I don't know if he would be a very good option at left wing back. That's the thing. Mm. I haven't seen enough of him as a attacking force to suggest that he would really thrive, especially initially under Conte. Maybe Conte can mould him, but I think... For even at Palace, I think his definitely strengths are... He's a bit like Juan Bissaka. He's like, his strengths are massively defensively. He's hard to beat. He can get forward, but he's not, like, amazing at getting forward. He does, like, a decent job, but he's not, like, incredible. And that's and we need someone who can really make a difference in the final third in our, in our wing-backs. So, I guess if Conte thinks he can develop him, then, yeah, I'll do it. But I, I just I have a feeling he's more suited to left-back than left-wing-back. Mm. All right. Um, and last but not least, uh, you're going to like this one. So Mikel Antonio has been talking. He says that he was shocked no action was taken against Sergio Regulon for slapping Aaron Questerell in the face um, during West Ham's 3-1 defeat to Tottenham. You know what I was shocked about? I was shocked Antonio didn't get any uh, action when he elbowed Eric Dyer in the face, which I thought was much worse. Yeah, I couldn't believe that if it didn't go to VAR, it didn't go to nothing. I saw Eric Dyer running to referee. He just said, he just elbowed me in the face, did nothing. Um, it was so cynical as well. And what was absolutely, I'm still shocked to this day that uh, nothing ever happened with that. And I, you know, the Regulon slap, it was a little whatever tap, but it was one of those where, like, like technically you're not allowed to hit someone in the face, fair enough, but like, it wasn't, he didn't actually hurt anyone, let's be honest. Yeah, he shouldn't be putting anyone's hands in anyone's faces, 100%. I agree, I, I agree with that. But let's be honest, what Antonio did was 100 times worse than what Regulon did. So I think he just needs to uh, be quiet and just uh, be lucky he didn't get sent off. Literally, I don't understand. Uh, I, I've seen that so many times and every time it gets worse. And it's just like literally ran up to him and just elbowed him in the face like that. It was mental and nothing. And then he goes, he has the actual nerve to come out and complain about stuff like that, uh, which is ridiculous in my opinion. But anyway, that um, is our Tottenham update for today. Let me know in the comment section below if you have any thoughts regarding any of the news stories brought to you today. Like, subscribe and comment. And as always, come, come on, on you Spurs. Spurs.